Welcome to the Ridgecrest Podcast. This is where we take time each week for a deeper look into the previous Sunday sermon. My name is Matt. I'm the Executive and Discipleship Pastor here at Ridgecrest. And joining with me today is our Senior Pastor, Michael Estes. And this is a very different podcast. It's our, our first real social distancing podcast. And so um, those of you who are watching will be able to see that we are in two very different places. Uh, but you know, the content is still good, and we're, we're still excited to kind of walk through the, the sermon of, uh, of this past Sunday. And Michael, thank you for making these accommodations and us sitting down together uh, digitally, I guess. I've got a very nice place to enjoy doing this, so it's, I, I don't mind doing it. And um, it is different. I mean, this is something I guess we're all getting used to it, with the way things are right now, is everybody's getting used to communicating in this way. And and doing things this way. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's gonna be good. Yeah. It, and it has been nice to where we've had some freedom to, to get out and work in different places like you, now, you know, outside and being able to enjoy nature a little bit. You know, I'm kind of cooped up in a room, you know, for, for the time being, hopefully to shield any um, five-year-old noise uh, running around, you know, but there, there are no guarantees. Um, it, it could be a very, very interesting podcast at any moment. Um, if, if, if he comes busting in, but it'll just be some excitement. It reminds me of the video I saw, uh, I guess it was a couple of years ago. It was somebody that was doing a, um, like a, he was doing an interview on, on one of the major news stations and all of a sudden in the background you, and he's at home and you see the door open and his little child like sneaks in and the mom crawls in on her hands and knees and pulls the child it was really funny he kept on yep. right on with the interview <laughs> so you know i mean it's not the first time it's ever happened if it happens today yeah th this could very quickly turn into that you know almost <laughs> identically so we'll we'll see how it goes um but i gotta jump in uh to our discussion uh this week was the i guess the penultimate message of the series uh with kind of looking at i am the vine and um, you know, a lot of, a lot of really good content in here. And, you know, and I think it's interesting, you know, last week when we looked at, um, his I am statement, both of these kind of take place in his final, uh, moments before being led to the cross of, uh, crucifixion that we'll be talking a lot about this week, uh, with Easter coming up. Um, but, but I think <clears throat> the idea of Jesus being the vine is a very interesting, um, illustration, you know, the, the an illustration that the disciples would have known very well because that they were, um, very knowledgeable in, um, vineyards and you look in the Old Testament and see that connection there um, so many different ways and so they would have understood what the purpose of this vine was and they understood the power behind a vine and its ability to produce fruit. Mm -hmm. One of the things specifically um, in, the, in the message in the passage of scripture that you read um, you know whenever they're in verse two um, you know of course previously we see Jesus saying that he is the true vine and the father is the one who's the vine dresser. So he's the one who does the pruning and we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, in verse two, it says every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. You know, so I think, you know, you see kind of two aspects of pruning here. And I want us to look at the first, you know, as far as taking away, you know, of someone. And so what does it mean for, in this passage here that the father is taking away those who aren't producing fruit. Yeah. And this is something that I didn't spend a, uh, any time on in the sermon, mostly because I was, I was focused in on a couple of other things, but um, it was something that definitely caught my attention whenever I was originally studying for this passage. And uh, you and I were talking a little bit beforehand, just kind of talking through, you know, some of the things that we saw, the commentaries that I looked at all talked about this in terms of people who, are kind of nominally Christians, people who, you know, have been in church for a long time or are generally associate themselves with Christianity, but have no real actual belief connection to the faith. And so uh, these are people that just kind of hang out and uh, are generally associated with Jesus or with the church or with uh, the, the idea of Christianity, but they have never actually done anything that would um, resemble faith. Um, and so it, we have a, we have an example of this a couple of chapters earlier in John, John chapter 13, where Judas is there with the disciples hearing, has his feet washed, hearing Jesus teach and, and seeing his miracles over the years and in the end betrays him, right? And he just walks out. And so 
he would be one of those branches that is just taken away because he was never really attached to, he was kind of generally in the same vicinity as the, the vine, but not actually attached to the vine in the way that the other disciples are. And so if we think about our day, the illustration I always heard that I liked is just because I stand in a garage doesn't make me a mechanic, right? Like I can, I can stand in the garage while, while the mechanics are doing the work on my truck or my, my car and just see them do the work and, and have a general idea of what they're doing. But that doesn't make me a mechanic in any way, shape or form. I, I don't really know, you know, what, what that means. And so um, I, I see that as very similar to what's going on here. It's, it's not about somebody losing their faith necessarily. It's about uh, people who um, either thought they had associated themselves with Jesus or claim Jesus, but don't really actually have any kind of real connection to it. Yeah, so, so we're not necessarily seeing, you know, while there are some individuals who believe you can lose your salvation, and um, that's another theological topic for, you know, another day, that's not really what this passage is talking about. You know, it's um, this idea, you know, I think it really gives us an example of the idea of saving faith. You know, uh, we, we, I think we've, we've talked about maybe this before on a previous podcast, you know, quite some time ago was, you know, Satan believes in who Jesus is. Uh, but there's a difference between just believing and having that knowledge versus saving faith that that Christ calls us to. And so I think I think you know what you said you know is a great example of that. Yeah, um, James chapter two, I think. Um, of course, I'm going to sit here and butcher. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, so chapter two, um, starting in verse 19. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. And yeah. so this idea that that just because I understand something or have believed something in the sense that, because like one of the things is if you look back at the Greek and, and, and Latin in particular is very helpful. There's different kinds of belief. There's just kind of intellectual knowledge. Like Judas knew that Jesus had done these things, but Judas had never actually put faith in that, that, that active believing in Jesus. And so that's, that's what we see. I think that's what we see here is that this idea that people may have some kind of understanding of who Jesus is, but that doesn't actually do anything to save them. Yeah, that's good. And I think that also kind of points to the importance of the producing fruit aspect of the, the production of fruit is what shows that that aspect or that branch is connected to the vine or requiring, you know, or absorbing the power from that vine um, that you talked about. Um, <clears throat> one of those interesting, you know, with, with gardening and stuff, you know, our family, we, we typically do a, a small garden each year and have for the past several years. And um, the tomato plant, you know, tomato vine is a, a very interesting plant that, you know, we have always, you know, done well with, you know, but one of the things it can get out of hand quickly and it starts getting all sorts of vines and kind of branches off of it. And um, while they may be producing fruit, you know, it can get very, you know, too thick, too overwhelming, and hard to keep track of, and just, uh, it can be a pretty, you know, daunting uh, task, mm -hmm. and I think what, what, what we see there is the, the, this idea that there's so much power coming from the vine out to these branches to provide the ability to produce fruit, and when we trim off some of the, the branches that are just wasting that power or absorbing that energy, um, when we can trim those off, it allows more healthy fruit to grow and develop, you know, and so, so I think, you know, you, you touched on that in your sermon, talked about the importance of the discipline and of pruning, you know, that the father does. And so, um, could you share just some practical ways that the father prunes, um, uh, his, his followers today and you know, how, how we can see that in our own lives? Yeah. So what I was thinking of when I, when I was thinking about this is this idea that there are some times where we, as people, that follow Jesus sometimes have uh, things that we care about that become what, what I think um, older the theologians, philosophers would call inordinate loves, things that um, aren't, aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves, but we, we put them in the place of, of God. Basically we, we allow them to become create these idols of the heart. Calvin talked about this idea that our, our hearts are idol factories, basically like, we, we see things that we enjoy and we enjoy them to the point that this becomes the most important thing for me. And so typically the way I see God's pruning working is it, the, the father sees these things that either have become idols or are becoming idols or have the potential to do that. 
and he begins to take these things away from us. And a lot of times we react, I think at the beginning of this process, we react very negatively to it. We think to ourselves, I don't understand why God's taking this away from me. Uh, this, is, this is important to me. I thought he cared about me. When in reality, we lack the perspective that the Father has. And so we, we while we're upset in the moment, at, after we have time and space to kind of deal with and understand what God's doing, uh, and hopefully that's what happens, is, is over time as he prunes us, we begin to understand this is part of that process. We look back and we think to ourselves, okay, I understand now what's, what's happening here. And, you know, I made reference to, to Hebrews 12. And, and in the end, like God is doing all this so that we can share his holiness. And that may not sound like a great thing in the, in the moment, but in reality, what that means is that I am becoming more like him so that I can be in his presence um, in the long run. And so uh, as he's taking these things away from me, basically what he's doing is he's preparing me to be with him. And he's preparing us to be able to be with each other in a way that's uh, productive and, and meaningful and, and good for both us and other people. And so, um, you know, that, so practically that looks like, let's say, well, one of the ways that I always was told to, that you can kind of look at this is look at the way you spend your time and your money. Um, that gives you a pretty clear picture about things you care about. So if I spend a lot of time on, and, and this is something that's close to me, like I really care about this, but I have to be very careful about this. Say you spend a lot of time on youth sports. Your kids like youth sports. You, so let's say you spend a lot of time doing those sorts of things. Well, it can be really easy for that to become an idol and I believe that God will occasionally take those things away from us so that we can see, hey, this is a real problem for me. I need to, I need to step back from this and understand its place. It's not that youth sports in and of themselves are wrong. Um, it's just that they're never meant to be the thing that brings us ultimate satisfaction or fulfillment. Um, you know, so it can even be things like our family, our children. You know, um, as me and you are both parents, it can be really easy to fall into the trap of turning our children in kind of, into kind of idols where we think to ourselves, well, I'm loving my child, but I spend so much time loving and caring about my child that I forget that I, there's an ultimate love that's supposed to be, I'm supposed to be led by. Right. And so, um, you know, in those moments where we realize, well, this, this love can be taken away or this love, and th these things can be taken away from me. Those are the moments where we start to understand that, like, I'm supposed to love God even if this happens. Not, not as long as he gives me this, but even – that's the way I always – I started talking about this a couple of years ago where a lot of us as believers have this as long as theology, as long as God does this for me or gives me this, I'll be fine. Like, I I'll have faith in him. But what happens when he takes those things away? So I, I think that we should have an even if theology. And I think you see that in the Psalms all the time. Even if you don't show up right now, even if you delay, even if uh, I have to wait, I still have faith in you. I know that you're that type of God. And so I think that ultimately, practically, when he takes things away from us, he's trying to get us to that even if place and not the as long as place. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, I think, you know, the, the even if can even be, you know, sometimes misconstrued as a lack of faith or a lack of trust in Jesus, you know, but, but it's really the complete opposite, uh, I think. And, um, you know, recognizing that when, when God does prune some of those things away, we learn to be content in all circumstances, you know, just as, as Paul wrote. And, um, you know, and as he kind of trims those things away that maybe have become idols or some things that just we, we enjoy and just maybe it, you know, could be some really good things, but they're just distracting us from producing the fruit um, that, that he would have us. Um, you know, saying along those lines and, you know, you can't talk about the Jesus as the vine and talking about the importance of producing fruit without actually talking about the fruit, you know, that, that yeah. Christians are to produce. And you mentioned that, you know, there in Galatians five, looking at the, the fruit of the spirit. <clears throat> and I, I think as you look at all those different um, uh, pieces of fruit, you know, essentially that that's mentioned there. How, how do each of those kind of pour back, you know, last week we kind of talked about the importance of all of us um, to make disciples and to teach and uh, lead others. You talked about the great commission in, in the sermon uh, this Sunday, you know, and as we kind of look at that and understand that, that is our calling to make disciples, how do each of these fruit kind of equip us to do that? 
Yeah, um, let's let's look at the list again really quickly. It's uh, Galatians 5.22. I'm just going to start with the actual different characteristics that we see here, and, and we can talk about a few of them, and hopefully after we talk about a few, they'll, it'll be kind of clear how these, these work to, to help us make disciples. So the list goes love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So let's let's think about um, self-control and how that might be uh, helpful in, in making disciples. Self-control to me is this idea that the older older theologians would have called it something along the lines of temperance, right? This ability to to basically tell myself no. Um, one of the first things that Jesus tells his disciples is they are to take up their cross daily and follow him. And it's just a denial of self. And I think a huge part of self-control is this ability to say no to myself, right? Well, one of the things that I have to be able to focus on is others whenever I'm thinking about making disciples. I can't worry as much about my time or my money or what I want to do. I have to think more about what God has called me to. And so a huge part of that is this ability to say no to myself and yes to what God would have me to do. And so that is, that is a type of self-control, right? Um, love. Obviously, that one's kind of the easiest one. If I don't love other people and um, I don't want them to experience the love that comes from Jesus, then, you know, I'm obviously not going to be very effective at making disciples. I'm probably not going to care about that at all. But when I am filled with love by the Spirit for uh, God and for others, it's going to be easy for me to tell other people about who Jesus is, right? Because I want them to experience that too, because that's the thing about love is that it's it's self-giving. It, it desires to give to others. I mean, when we say that God is love, what that means is that for eternity, he has desired to give love to others because ultimately that's where love comes from, right? Is, that's what, that's, I guess, the general characteristic of love is that it's giving. It, it desires to give itself to others. And um, uh, peace, you know, if I'm, if I'm anxious about everything, what happens is I immediately turn inward, right? If I'm experiencing anxiety, I'm thinking about protecting myself. I'm, I'm worried about what ha might happen to myself. But if I have peace, I'm automatically able to be content with the situation that I'm in, and it allows me to think outwardly, to think about other people. And so you can just kind of go through the list and see all these things as it, it makes it much, it, all of these things prepare us to make disciples because these are all outgrowths of, uh, you know, ultimately this love that we get from Jesus, this joy that we get from Jesus, the peace that we get, all of these things flow out of us and into the world and others can experience it through through us. And so, you know, that's, I think you can work your way through the list and see how each of these things can be used to help us make disciples. Yeah. <clears throat> and essentially what you're saying is kind of goes back to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, I believe, you know, this idea of shifting from being me centered to other centered, you know, as you went through that list and looked at every single one of those, that was the main thing you brought out was how it prepares us to interact with others and care more about others than ourselves. Um, you know, one of the aspects, of course, it's called the fruit of the spirit. Um, you know, the, the key aspects of that is the role of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we, we all, you know, as followers of Christ, hopefully we have this desire to um, hear from the spirit. We have this desire for God to prune us as we're talking about here. Um, but, but how does someone, you know, who, who is, maybe has that desire, you know, how do they actually learn to hear from the Holy Spirit as well as kind of develop a readiness to obey God's word that he kind of reveals to us? All right. So let's, I think we'll answer both parts of the, uh, we'll answer the question separately because there's two parts to the question. The first part is this idea of learning to hear from the Holy Spirit. Uh, I will uh, repeat this until the day that the Lord takes me from this earth the word is the way the spirit speaks. And so if we want to hear from the spirit then we have to be in the scriptures and we have to be seeking to hear from him. I mean, like that's one of the things that if we think about listening to people, um, the way um, M Scott Peck talks about this in one of his books, he talks about the, the difference between passively listening and actively listening. And, and he talked about that in reference to like parents and their children. So there are times when, we're in the car together and my children are talking to me, but I'm not really paying attention. Uh, I'm kind of, you know, I hear the background noise and I'm listening for like a particular word or a particular uh, tone of voice or something like that to where I need to pay attention. 
actively listening is very different than that. I, I am I am seeking out information and I am seeking out um, I want to I want to know what's actually going on. I want to understand what somebody's thinking. And so when we pick up the scriptures and we start to seek God um, and seek to know what he has to say to us, the spirit will use that and will teach us. That's one of the things that the teacher, the, the spirit is called is he's called the teacher. Um, he's called the helper. And so he, he comes alongside us and he helps us uh, as we seek to understand who God is. And, um, and that's, that's the first part is this, I have to, and if I want to, if I want to learn um, to hear from the Holy Spirit, I have to actively seek to, to hear him. And I can't, can't just think to myself, well, it's going to hit me like a bolt lightning one day and all of a sudden, boom, God's going to speak to me. That may happen. More than likely, it's not. More than likely, he, he's going to use the tools that he's already given us. And by the way, that can happen in our interactions with other people. Um, if, somebody, if somebody comes to us, we, you know, we have something that we're concerned about and we need advice, and somebody opens the scripture to us and shows us something, that can be the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Um, the, and the thing that we all, we've talked about before, the Spirit's never going to speak contrary to the word, right? So if there's something that, you know, we're not sure whether or not we need to be involved in or whether or not this is something that we're going to be good at, or if we seek the, seek, uh, the Spirit in the scriptures, we're going to find out the truth. He's never going to say, well, you see this in the, in the Bible here. I'm going to tell you to do something opposite of that. He won't ever do that because he, he works uh, with the word. The second part, this, this is kind of important too, that develop a readiness to obey God's word. I think this goes back to that idea of being pruned earlier that we talked about. Yeah. Um, when we don't do that, what happens is we get frustrated. As believers, I think ultimately we're going we're gonna to get really frustrated really quickly because we'll find out that um, we're still trying to live life a way that, that God has not designed us for. And so because we're not designed for it, we get really frustrated really quickly with it. And the, the spirit will, will discipline us uh, because we're his children, because uh, the way Hebrew 12, Hebrews 12 puts it, that we're sons and that he, wants to, he loves us and he wants to guide us into um, truth. And so that readiness comes through, I think, experience with hearing and seeing that work out in real life, right? Uh, when we hear God speak to us and we, we live according to what he said, and all of a sudden, you know, I change or something around me changes or I see somebody's life change because I share, you know, the gospel with them. Those are moments where all of a sudden experientially I see it work. I see it at work and I want to be a part of it. And so I make myself more and more ready to listen as God speaks to me. So, yeah. <clears throat> so essentially, you know, what, what you're saying is we need to take an active part in that and not just wait for the Holy Spirit just to hit us upside the head with something, but um, taking he will, by the way, he'll hit you upside the head every now and then, but, but I think actively seeking is a better way to do it for sure. Yeah. You know, and, and, and like you said, we're, we're without excuse because we have the content of scripture that we can spend time in, you know, and, and read, you know, we talk about, you know, taking time daily, but you know, we, we have the opportunity to read minute by minute, you know, hour by hour, you know, um, any opportunity we have, we, we, we should be seeking that, that chance to get into God's word and understand, you know, his call for us, our lives a little bit better. Um, I want us to shift now, you know, kind of from the content of, of the message to kind of look at this week um, or kind of leading into Easter. Mm -hmm. um, we, we talked about last week on the podcast, uh, uh, something that we were kind of working on as a staff to uh, make available for our church members. And that is a, a, officially out now. You know, those of you who are listening to the podcast today is technically day two of it, you know, it started um, yesterday on Monday. If you're listening on this to this the day it came out, but essentially it, it began April 6th and will take us through uh, Easter Sunday. Um, and so, I was just wanting you to maybe talk a little bit of that, Michael, or you know, even even outside of that. Once we talk through that a little bit, even what are some things our people can do this week as Easter and you know is going to look very different, not just from a church standpoint you know, but also from a family standpoint, you know, families aren't going to necessarily be able to gather um, as many do, you know, on, on an Easter holiday and things like that. And so, so as we kind of look at that, you know, what are some things that our church members can do this week to really prepare their hearts for Easter and as well as, you know, make the most of this season, even though it's going to look very different? 
Yeah. So I think there's a couple of tools. The one that we created for you guys is going to be, um, I think, a really good tool. It's it's not something that's going to be um, super intensive in the sense it's going to take you hours and hours every day to to complete. It's it's going to going to take 15 to 20 minutes maybe every day. Um, and then what it does is it redirects you. So let's say you've been busy working all day, or you've been at home all day trying to manage the children as as you're going through this new kind of homeschooling process or whatever it is that you've been doing all day what it does is it's a it's designed to bring you back bring back to remembrance the things that we've talked about when we think about who Jesus is um and so as we get to this very last uh sermon on on Jesus being the resurrection and the life all of this stuff is going to point us in that direction and kind of prepare us for that particular day. Um, so I think that's one tool uh, that, that we would encourage you guys to use. Um, and if you have any trouble, you know, getting it or, or finding, finding out where it is, shoot, feel free to shoot us an email. Uh, we will help you find it. Another thing is, let's say you miss a day. You don't have to go back and make days up. Each day is kind of separated they do connect in, around Jesus, but ultimately, if you get behind, don't feel like, okay, I can't catch up now, or I've got to, you know, I just got to give up on this thing. You can do each day individually, separately, and not feel like you've missed something the day before. Um, uh, so we want to encourage you guys to take advantage of that, but there are other things out there. I mean, um, I know that, you know, I'm not a huge fan of uh, looking up the Bible on, on my phone, mostly because I get distracted really easily. That's a personal thing. I like holding a, a physical Bible in my hands, but the, the U version app of uh, the Bible has some great um, kind of devotional tools that you can use as you, you're, you work your way through a week, especially a week like this one. It's a holy week. Um, so that's another tool that you can use. I think it's just being intentional and active. Uh, we talked about this idea of actively seeking to understand who God is. Uh, I think a week like this is one of those weeks where we have a tendency to be just more aware uh, and more uh, attuned to those sorts of things. And I want to encourage our people in that, that, that they really do that. Um, make sure, yes, that this is a time to be more aware and more attuned. So take advantage of that. You're, you know that spiritually you're ready for that. Um, and so to, to, to not let that go by the wayside and what you'll find is, and one of the things that you don't want to do too, is that you don't want this to kind of be like this mountaintop experience. And then there's this gradual decline for a while until we get to the next mountaintop. No, make this a, an opportunity to have this upward trend in your life as far as growing spiritually, and then just take this and take, continue on with it. Um, so uh, those are some of the things that I would encourage. Obviously, don't focus on the things that you don't get to do this year. Um, I think that's an easy thing for us to do right now is to focus on the things that we miss or the things that we're not going to be able to enjoy. Focus on the things that maybe are different this year that you may never experience again as far as Easter goes. Like you may never uh, be around with your children watching the service and being able to have one-on-one -on -one discussions with the with your children as they're talking about this idea of Jesus being the resurrection and the life like you can't do that in a normal church service you'd have to get up and leave the church service and it would be kind of distracting to you and to other people but you're at home and you have this opportunity now to talk to your children so like those are the types of things that you know I want to encourage our church members to do is to is to think about the things that they do they will get to enjoy that are different than maybe most years that we do this yeah, yeah, I, th I think <clears throat> you know that's great, and the, the the best thing about it is you know Easter's still here, you know e Easter's still coming, and um, you have this you know pinnacle, you know, or this this cornerstone of our faith and resurrection, you know that still happened, and uh, while a lot of times we have turned that into more of you know a family focus or family gathering, which all that's great, you know. Uh, the true meaning and the true understanding of the resurrection, you know, it's still a reason to celebrate. And I love what you said, you know, as far as just, you know, this year's different, you know, it's going to be different. So rather than dwelling on what we're missing, let's focus on some of the ways we can make the most of this um, because this may be very different Easter than we'll ever have again, you know, and so let's, let's make the most of it. And uh, the Easter unpacked devotional uh, that we worked on as a staff is um, available on, uh, church website as well as the church app you can get on there and, and access that as a pdf just to download and um, there's a few um i guess supplies that you'll need each day but there's a supply list in the beginning of that so you can get them all together one day we tried to make it super simple 
um, because again, with you know, you know, staying at home and things of that sort, it, it can be hard to get certain supplies. So we tried to make it as simple as we could, and just a way to make it very meaningful uh, for you as an individual, if you live by yourself, or you as a family, to really celebrate and focus on who Jesus is this week leading up to Easter. Um, so as always, we want to thank you uh, for listening and thank you for joining us for the Ridgecrest podcast. Uh, we hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.